Junyu is a theoretical physicist currently working uh, at the University of Chicago and with IBM. Um, and he is interested in theoretical physics, its relation to computation, including random matrix theories, machine learning optimization, quantum computing, and commercial value of modern computing technologies. And today we'll hear his talk about, well, quantum representational learning. So very curious to learn more about it. Thank you for coming and floor is yours. Okay, so can, can you hear me? Okay, great. So thank you very much for your invitation and it's my great uh, honor and uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. So um, I'm a theoretical physicist and uh, I'm currently working for U Chicago and IBM. So I use, uh, in this year, I, was, I used to be a grad student in Caltech and uh, doing have a joint background in high energy physics and quantum information science. And currently, um, I was mostly working on where quantum information science and the, its relation to physics in general. And uh, uh, this the topic I wish to talk today is about uh, quantum machine learning using some um, theoretical uh, method, which we call it quantum neural tenure kernels. So my research is funded by those institutions, uh, including University of Chicago, IBM, and this called Chicago Quantum Exchange and the Molecular Engineering Department of U Chicago, and also Cullen Center for Theoretical Physics in U Chicago. It, it, the work is based on this paper and, uh, and also some other paper, uh, uh, there is another work working in progress with those people and uh, uh, led by Lian Jian in U Chicago and uh, Antonio Mezzocapo in IBM and also Francisco Tacino and, Je and Jennifer Gleek. And uh, they are from IBM and also University of Chicago. So the title of the talk is uh, Quantum representation learning, a theory of quantum neural tenure kernels. I will explain what those mean, words mean. And roughly speaking, um, just now Manuel talks about how to evaluate or how to take a look on the variational quantum methods numerically from some practical uh, version methods. But right now I'm talk providing a different perspective in theory that how to evaluate the value of a variational methods before you actually do the learning. So uh, let's start from a brief review on the big picture of this work. We know that uh, quantum machine learning is an area that is in a fast development and promising, but currently it's still lots of mm, not, not super clear and in every details. And uh, machine learning and quantum computing are two important technologies uh, in the modern society, and it's natural to consider merging those two together. However, sometimes people, currently people still didn't completely understand many details of quantum machine learning. So firstly, and how you define quantum machine learning. So many uh, different people have different uh, models maybe. And then people want to know why quantum machine learning and where is the quantum advantage? So how, why you want to do quantum machine learning instead of classical ones? And what is their quantum advantage? So, and then what is the typical problems of quantum machine learning? And what is the corresponding quantum database for quantum machine learning? So those things might be the flagship application of those algorithms and quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, and in the, maybe in the real life, but then people are also curious about what is the proper quantum machine learning algorithm. So all of them are in investigation and in development, uh, but people still want to understand better those big picture problems. But we already know there are lots of things um, that will provide us some helpful hint. For instance, we, we know that the data itself will either I mean, from classical world or the quantum world. So in either case, it has a problem of how to communicate your data to the quantum devices. So here we have this QRAM quantum random access memory as a quantum version of the data structure that will allow a logarithmic um, time and circuit depths to transfer your say classical data to the to the quantum database and then that might be important for machine learning because and there are many algorithms that rely on quantum algorithms that might need quantum random access memory and also for the output process and how to extract 
uh, output from the data quantum device this is also a recently very hot hot topic starting from Arison about shadow tomography and um, and the classical shadows by Huang Kong and Prisco and um, those will tell you some information about how to make predictions from uh, say uh, quantum devices and how to extract the measurements this is the output problem and then there are some algorithms also that has been well established. For instance, HHL algorithms uh, that tell us, let's say, how to solve the linear algebra problem uh, for the sparse matrix inversion. There is a speed up, significant speed up uh, in quantum uh, devices that could uh, let you solve some linear pro uh, algebra problems very efficiently. And those might be very important for machine learning. And because we know that many of the machine learning process are linear algebra. So those are some things that we know. So specifically today, I think many of you are already expert of this. I will talk about Bayesian quantum algorithms that is given by that is called, considered as a near term version of the uh, of the quantum machine learning or quantum simulation optimization and many related works. And then it is some uh, unitaries that are parameterized by some version angle theta. And then this is some sort of a hybrid quantum classical version of quantum algorithms that has been developed previously by say, one of them is Allen and from many of you are um, belongs to that group. And then uh, there are famous examples of version quantum eigensolver VQE and uh, for the needs quantum computational chemistry. And also there are quantum neural networks that is given by this VQA type. And then there are people, but however, it is not very easy to understand as you noticed from Emmanuel's talk before the landscape of this uh, version quantum circuits are complicated. So sometimes people already know some generic features of rational quantum algorithms. For instance, we have the Baron plateau, and uh, and then which tells us in some sense it is kind of a no-go theorem or a no-go statement that uh, it seems that it's not that efficient, and uh, for your, your your rational angles will run sufficiently slow, and um, and in some cases, and um, and then that might be challenging for some problems in VQAs. So however, we do want to understand better about the nature of VQAs and rational quantum algorithms. And then hopefully that it will provide us more guidance on solving the big picture problem that I was mentioning before. So today I will talk about this so-called quantum neural tainted kernel. So which is a, an analytic theory of quantum machine learning or rational quantum algorithms. And then this is a picture about cats, but I will explain what it means later. Uh, but here it just gives you a, just a glimpse um, of the basic concepts. And then uh, hopefully our theory will, will solve part of the following problem. So firstly, how to choose variational edits. And before training, and can you determine them in theory? So how good the convergence will, will be, at least in some limit. And then furthermore, we, we want to know that how, what does the dynamics, the gradient descent dynamics looks like? Can they converge efficiently? And then what is the difference between quantum machine learning and machine learning? So hopefully our theory could solve part of those problems, at least in some limit, and provide, provide us more theoretical guidance before training. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. So firstly, I will mention, quant briefly introduce you quantum neural tangent kernels. And then I will mention the classical analog of uh, the quantum neural tangent kernel and the large width limit. And then I will talk about how to generalize these ideas to the quantum theory. And then in some limits, I will show you how to analytically solve the dynamics of gradient descent um, in, um, in the quantum neural networks. And then I will comment an important connection between the so-called large width theory and the barren plateau problem uh, in quantum machine learning. And finally, I will give some conclusions. So until now, do you have any questions? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, quantum neural network, as we know, are some parameterized gate and then by rational angle theta and also some constant gate WL and then 
initialized by some state and then we do some measurement and finally we uh, we extract the answer. So this is a quantum neural, time, uh, neural networks. It, have, it might have complicated uh, structure inside those unitaries. So you could train it uh, in a gradient descent. And for instance, this is a small example where we did some simple numerical task in the IBM simulation and uh, and using QSKIT that um, in, in there is a key difference between quantum classical that currently quantum devices have noise. So it might be uh, sometimes it may, might induce some trouble, but uh, people are already able to perform those numerical uh, simulation and of gradient descent and numerical uh, calculation in the near term devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, and then I will briefly introduce this so-called neural tangent kernel theory and the large width limit. So here I'm considering the loss function, which is a mean square loss, which is given by a square, uh, square and the sum of the square of the difference between the prediction and uh, the, the predicted, um, the known training data and in the framework of supervised learning. So here, uh, for a theoretical reason, I have to consider this mean square loss instead of the logarithmic uh, loss or entropy loss. But uh, so in this mean square loss, and then uh, we define the difference between the data prediction and the um, and a data label and the model output to be the so-called residual training error, which is just this difference. And then the gradient descent equation in the simplest form is given by this um, gradient descent formula, where this fancy D and of theta means just a variational difference between two time steps in the gradient descent dynamics. This is given by the learning rate eta times the derivative of uh, your loss function over the variational angle. So, however, so uh, if you uh, use this step and do the linear expansion of the residual training error and plug this formula into the residual training error, so you will get this funny formula where this fancy D is now equal to a matrix times the vector. So the matrix, the matrix itself is given by some, the derivative of predictions on the variational angle theta. And this matrix times the vector uh, is, um, it will give you, and times the learning rate will give you the difference of two steps of the uh, predictions and uh, which is the same as the difference of residual training error. And so this, this funny matrix itself and uh, is similar to the kernel method. It has all the properties of PDS kernels, positive stimulus definite, and it's also symmetric. And this kind of kernel, which is running during gradient descent, is called neural tangent kernel uh, that has been already established in classical theory. So what is the usage of this object? You could already observe that if you say fix this uh, neural tangent kernel K, and this if this matrix uh, is a constant, then it it becomes an exponential convergence procedure. That this looks like a differential equation and the solution of it is an exponential decaying process. And uh, this is something that you are able to analytically solve just like what we solve in a, in a linear regression. So this exponential convergence is a result of linear regression algorithms. So this is the neural tangent kernel. And then, uh, in classical people, and they have uh, established a theorem, a remarkable theorem, that to tell you that when the neural tangent kernel is approximately a constant. So this is in the limit where the neural network have a su sufficient large width. So here, uh, what I mean by width is that uh, I'm considering classical neural network and MLP models. So MLP is the simplest uh, multiple layer precipitum model in machine learning. And then I will define the terminology here, the depth in the classical world is the number of layers and the width is the number of neurons in each layer. So for instance, here it has three depths and also, but it has, this first layer has five width and the third la uh, second layer has three width, et cetera. So that is the definition. And then people say that for large, uh, for MLPs in large width limit, the neural tangent kernel is approximately a constant during gradient descent. And the correlation function of the neural outputs is approximately Gaussian. 
The perturbative corrections are given by a ratio, which is given by depth divided by width. So if you don't understand the, the statement, it's fine. But uh, I, I want to just simply uh, make an analogy to the quantum field theory that physicists are familiar with. Actually, it's very similar to perturbative quantum mechanics or perturbative quantum field theory. So the large width limit is similar to the large n limit, where n is, you could understand it as a, a number of degree of freedom, or you could understand it as SUN gauge group in your physical system. And the depths or um, divided by width ratio is something like a coupling constant. And if you add a free, uh, at a large width limit and for the sufficient wide neural, neural networks, it means the weak, weakly coupled theory. And the deep neural networks means the strongly coupled theory. So this is a rough uh, correspondence and uh, from the physics language to the machine learning language. So this is in fact, uh, one of the reasons that how those people discover those theorems and because some of them have this physics background. So this theorem is under the assumption where firstly, the learning rate has to be small. And secondly, I have to average over the weight and bias and computing an expectation value. So the definition of the neural tangent kernel outputs correlation function, uh, a neural, neural network outputs correlation function is over the average over weights and bias when you are doing the initialization, okay? So this is a brief example. Uh, this is a brief introduction of the neural tangent kernel theory. And right now I'm happy to talk about how to generalize this theory to quantum. So you could do a similar analysis, but a toy example, which I think you might understand better is optimization, uh, which is the simplest version of the quantum or Q and TK theory. So, uh, uh, Let's consider a variational analysis and acting on state, and we are going to compute some expectation values and of some operators, say it is a Hamiltonian. We are doing VQE, we are minimizing its energy. And then uh, you could also derive a similar formula, or this, and in this case, the number uh, appear here is not a matrix. Uh, this, uh, this analog of neural tangent kernel is given by the epsilon d theta square. And this object itself is a number instead of metrics, but this is an optimization problem. So it does not have training data. Uh, so it is a reduced version of the neural tangent kernel. You could do computations from the first principle directly and then try to, uh, try to say that, um, let's say given a bunch of variational assets and uh, you can just compute this number. So we notice that, so firstly this K is highly nonlinear and in a variational angle because you could say that it depends on unitary U and so it depends on the variational angles. So this is what we mean by representation learning. Uh, representation learning means that you are learning the feature of the data and the feature map of the data right now is determined in some sense by the kernel. And, and then because the kernel is changing during gradient descent, that means that you are extracting the feature uh, from the data. So currently it's a toy problem, but it partially already show you some representation learning or representation optimization features. So, uh, but you could instead consider a real machine learning problem where you consider some feature maps and then you map your original data to a Hilbert space and then you compute the expectation value and uh, try to extract the output. And this loss function right now is very similar to this classical language. So you could directly derive the analog of quantum version of neural tangent kernel. Okay, so right now it is again satisfies all the kernel property. It is positive semi-definite and it's symmetric. And it's, it is a matrix instead of a number, which is a natural extension of uh, neural tangent kernels in the quantum regime. And also we prove that this K is also always positive semi-definite and, and symmetric. And also this K is highly nonlinear in terms of theta, which tells you some highly nonlinear property of the rational simulation. Okay, so uh, uh, in this, uh, and then I will talk about in some case, the neural tank kernel is indeed a constant and which we call it frozen neural tank kernel and quantum meta kernel. And, uh, uh, in fact, so the observation of the constant neural tangent kernel is a generic feature, even may not be related to the large width. 
as a third, first step usually people do is that when the gradient descent is small in, slow enough, say it is around the end of training, and the trainable parameters do not vary that much. So this is called nasal training. And in some sense, we are expanding the variational angle theta to a fixed value of theta star times a perturbation. And in this case, we will have exactly solvable answer using perturbation theory. And then this is what I mean by this picture where during the gradient descent and you have a quantum neural tangent kernel, which is some uh, kind of a uh, metric during the gradient descent dynamics. And around the time where your rational angle does not that vary that much, and then you are in a regime of frozen NTK where a neural tiny kernel is constant. But in the middle, and because it is highly, highly nonlinear, it is called representation learning because it could extract features from the data, even if the quantum feature map is fixed. Okay. So we could analytically compute the frozen neural tangent kernel even before the training, and we have a guaranteed exponential convergence. So in that case, we could try to and make predictions even before the training. We could make say that how fast it will decay uh, eventually. So can you say again? Uh, oh, sorry, what's your question? No, oh, just like five minutes left. Ah, oh, okay, great. Okay, so uh, it's fine. So, so then we are uh, going to simulate, uh, we have, in fact, we have already simulated this in the real IBM device using numerical simulation of the real noise data from the IBM device. Currently, we are preparing large experiment in progress, larger experiment, but here it is some small experiments with real noise data, but not really a, a real device a simulation, which we could say that in late time, we compute the neural tangent kernel in the quantum regime. And we say that it indeed it is exponential decaying, which means that in late time, the eigenvalues of the neural tangent kernel is indeed approaching a constant. So, um, so that is even holding in a noisy case where in the late time, in some cases, the eigenvalue of the neural tangent kernel will just, just decay and approach into a constant. So this will tell you that in some sense, this current theory is uh, in several cases is, is already kind of robust against error. However, uh, in, it is important in the near future to develop a say a full turn version or a in, in, uh, where it includes the error into the theory. But currently we already say that it works pretty well at the late time, even for a noisy device environment. So, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we could do the perturbation theory beyond the linear regime. And this is a leading order perturbation theory that is given by quantum meta kernel. And then we do computations. So this time it's not really exponential decay, but it is a linear uh, decay times the exponential decay. So it is a little bit uh, slower, but it's still vanishing to zero. So and we have analytic predictions and even before the training for the leading order uh, prediction, that leading order prediction is given by a quantity that is a higher order than the neural tangent kernel, which we call a quantum meta kernel. And uh, the quantum meta kernel is not generically generalized in the sense that it might depend on algorithms, not as simple as, um, as linear regression because it includes higher order corrections. It might have more uh, local minima. So this is a feature of algorithm dependence that tell you something about the representation learning detail of the theory. So we did the theoretical works and also some numerical works um, about, about quantum meta kernel in this type. And finally, I wish to comment briefly about the connection between uh, the large width and the, and the barren plateau. The argument of the barren plateau is based on the fact that uh, your, your answer is sufficiently higher random. So which is given roughly by this, uh, this, uh, this formula, which is a quantum one design formula. And this randomness is very similar to actually the initialization procedure of random initialization for classical neural networks. So this indicates for me a connection between those two. And in fact, and we uh, and another group um, and obtain that. And uh, in fact, for sufficiently deep neural networks, and then we will have the conclusion that uh, you perform the gradient descent faster. 
So what it means is that when you are neural network is deep enough, deep enough, we are able to avoid this barren plateau problem in the sense that the barren plateau is only on the variational angles from their original argument. But if if you plug back from your variational angle to the to the to the gradient descent dynamics and to consider the error or the loss function, you will find better performance. And even when, when you introduce more parameters, the gradient descent becomes better in a large width or in the barren plateau regime. So this is something we are doing in progress, but uh, hopefully it will appear soon, which is kind of the main motivation that is after this work and how to avoid the barren plateaus for deep neural quantum neural networks. So finally, I wish to mention some open problems. So we have made some classical contribution of our world that is even beyond quantum. Let's say, for instance, a complex generalization of the classical neural tangent work theory because uh, quantum mechanics itself is complex. And then we derive the first formula of the frozen NTK and the quantum meta calculation in the lazy learning process that I talked about before. And we did make a discussion about different versions of initializations and uh, including this people so-called NTK initialization and the standard initialization in the classical large width limit. And uh, for the quantum side, there are several open problems. So firstly, we wish to connect the practical guidance of variational uh, quantum methods say that you give me a practical guidance team made by UCC methods or some other methods, we can tell you some theories that is about this. And we could also do some ODE nonlinear dynamics of quantum gradient descent. And say we have this nonlinear kernel that have representation learning feature, we can solve it using ODE theory. And then before solving it, ODE theory could already tell you how, how good it is or how bad it is from some mathematics. And of course, connection to the barren plateau is working in progress. And as I mentioned before, we also have to consider the effect of quantum norms. So thank you for in attendance and sorry that it is a little dense information. So uh, and, and do you have any questions? Uh, so you, uh, I, had, I had a very small, uh, like if you can, can you go to the slide where you showed the, introduce the quantum neural tangent kernels, like the, the kernel definitions and stuff? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like, uh, no, actually, uh, can you go to the quantum version where you, yeah. 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 So, like, uh, I don't get, like, when you write these two, uh, aren't they just the same two differential? I, I was confused about, like, when you write the kernel, which is like the summation of L, B epsilon, del theta L, is it, is it the same differential that you're writing or are these two different uh, differentials? Yeah. Sorry, what do you mean? But oh, you mean this two factors? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they are the same. They are exactly the same in the case of optimization. In the case of optim optimization, but they are different. Uh, in a in a learning case. Uh, in a learning case, uh, because we have the input data label and the event label, uh, which is event label is given by delta, and the output dimensions is given by uh, i. And in this formula, it becomes a matrix, a tensor instead of uh, uh, a number. So, but in this reduced case, you can understand this number. It's just a number, and uh, these two derivatives are the same. So, and it is a one by one matrix. Okay, and uh, so like okay. Uh, uh, so this this basically like reduces this this whole. Uh, I guess uh, in in the neural tangent theory, you had these data labels and the output, and so like in this case, it just reduces to a number. So it it, it basically is a fixed quantity in some sense. Right. So it's a fixed quantity, uh, but it's in general it will change during gradient descent dynamics because you notice that u dagger and u and those things are depending on the variational angle of theta. So so during gradient descent dynamics, this changing this kernel itself is wronging. So uh, usually when you are doing the kernel method itself and uh, the kernel method, uh, the kernel is fixed, but right now the kernel is running. So this is what we mean by feature learning. So it is, uh, it's a number, but this number is changing during gradient descent dynamics in general. But we are investigating some case where this is approximately a constant. And in that case, we could analytically solve the problem. And beyond this limit, we are able to use a perturbation theory. 
Okay, ah, great, thanks. And my other question, I think uh, someone also asked a similar question was uh, like, you 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 said that you you were able to learn these features right on the go so you you uh, start with kind of like some assumption or like you have this initial kind of like uh, approximation to your kernel and then as you go along the training you're learning this kernel which is like a feature map from uh from your input one space to other space right or your quantum space so yeah. how 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 good or like is that when when you're looking from a classical uh, to quantum uh, feature map in some sense uh, right, so this is a uh, this is an encoding or a feature map that is running from a uh, data to to from the data to the Hilbert space, and this feature map could be fixed. But what we are saying that even if this feature map is fixed, the kernel itself is running. So because even if this phi i is fixed, it's a fixed function. But during the gradient descent dynamics, this kernel itself is is uh, still depending on the version level theta. So that is what we mean by feature learning or representation learning. Okay, so like the feature is kind of like fixed, but you're you're changing the kernel uh, in some sense, and right, so right. Uh, and in some sense, it effectively changes the feature because uh, you could understand this change as uh, some unitaries acting on this feature map in some sense. So it effectively changes the feature, and even if originally your feature map itself is fixed, but uh, you will find it's effectively running during gradient descent dynamics. Okay, so I, I get confused yet again. So when you said the unit tree is changing, that's changing because uh, it's moving along the gradient and that's dependent on the parameters, right? right. Is that correct? Right, so, exactly. Okay, so you are basically like following the gradient direction and that is giving you an effective uh, like feature map. That, right, that... right, right, right. And uh, in fact, when you are doing the, uh, when you are in some limits where your rational angle does not change that much, or if you have in some limits that this neural tangent kernel is approximately a constant. So in that case, uh, this kernel method itself and the gradient descent dynamics becomes equivalent. And because your kernel is fixed, and what you could do is that in that case, just compute the neural tangent kernel itself pretend this as a kernel in the kernel method and do the linear regression using the kernel method. So that is one way of solving this gradient descent dynamics also, but those two methods are equivalent only in the, in the limit where your neural tangent kernel is a constant. But, but you don't see the, the vanishing gradient phenomena that uh, as you showed later uh, when you increase these layers, right? So like, I guess something is changing here, which kind of like takes you away from the baron plateau uh, phenomena here. So, so what I'm commenting here now, so baron plateau problem is not the same as versional uh, va vanishing gradient, uh, from my opinion, because vanishing gradient is a gradient that is keep decaying during the training process or keep decaying during layers. So it is a dynamical uh, procedure. But right now the gradient, so the, the, the barren plateau is the analysis of theta that they say that theta is changing during all possible, I mean, possible value of theta. So this is independent of the dynamics. So barren plateau is something people feel it's unique and this word is actually created by quantum scientists. But here we are pointing out that. So even if you have the barren plateau in theta, you may not have anything bad in the loss function itself. So the reason is because if you have sufficiently a large number of training parameters, your uh, trainable parameters are large and you have that deep uh, neural networks, it is the quantum analog of the large width limit in the classical language. And in that case, even if you have the barren plateau, even if each theta changes slowly, but from the original random initialization to some local optimal and you, the distance is not that long, it is short. And you are still able to get some predictions. And this is what these figures say. And that you have more and more layers, this loss function decays faster. And this decaying coefficient is pro proportional to theoretically making, uh, we are able to make predictions and it's upper bounded or proportional to the number of layers L. So if L is larger, the decay is larger for sufficiently deep 
uh, neural networks. This is our opinion. So this is not so this this sorry uh i think we are kind of like out of time but we can probably like keep discussing this after or right. if anyone else has a question feel sure. free to ask sure, sure. yeah okay so thank you very much for for this talk and for coming let's yeah. officially close and move discussion to, to afterwards <laughs>